Hi, thank you for coming here. So um, when, when Ben showed us the list of topics, I know it was a little bit awkward because, ah, thank you. He thought that we would think that they were thinking we were ugly, but um, we're not afraid of ugly. <laughs> ugly is what we do. In fact, Lucy and I have tasked ourselves with that exact thing. Lucy and I have built a mobile app for honest advice on that very insight that honest advice can be ugly. And so over the past two years, we've been creating a sense of place for ugly. When Geneva, I believe, submitted this topic for Creative Mornings, they were talking about how the beginnings of the creative process can be quite ugly. But for us, ugly isn't just the beginning of our creative process. Ugly is our persistent challenge. Brian tweeted this out the other day as I was putting my slides together and, and I was so happy because <laughs> it reminded me of what I love about creatives. <laughs> and because it's such a good warm up. Um, what I love is your incredible ability to take criticism, everything from honest advice to rejection in the most thick skinned and productive way. You do it because it improves your work. That's what happens in the panic phase, right? So how many people in the last week have received some critique of their work? Just about everyone. And, and for how many of you did that improve your work? Amazing. Our story, which we're about to tell, is about the insight that we so rarely apply that very ingrained behavior, getting honest advice on our professional work to reap the benefits and make greater work to our personal lives. And our story is about that realization, about what we've learned from the ugly of doing that ourselves, from giving and receiving honest advice, and then about the subsequent creative journey that has been ugly in the beginning, to embark on creating a permanent sense of place for ugly. My story begins in March 2013. I just had twin boys. Super cute, super unexpected. I like looking at their eyes in this picture because that's kind of how I felt. <laughs> like a deer in headlights. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> they were my third and fourth sons. I was a year and a half into a research business that I had started and it was just taking off. And uh, the twins blindsided me. I was excited about this idea of extreme motherhood though. I thought, you know, this is like a new reality TV show. I'm gonna have four kids, I'm gonna have a startup, I'm just gonna do it. It's gonna be extreme mothering. <laughs> but the nights were hard. <laughs> the nights were horrid. You get it? Hard, hearted. <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough. And some of you who may have twins can resonate with that. Every night, I just, I dreaded it. From the moment I got out of bed, and I don't mean from the moment I woke up, because I was up all night. <laughs> Breastfeeding two, two babies is, is like the kind of thing that requires focus you have to train for your whole life. You have to have the perfect lighting, the perfect pillow, the perfect chair, the perfect posture. You have to have lots of extra hands. You have to be comfortable. You have to keep the light on and have a glass of water. And you need help with it, except you can't have help because you do it all night long. And so that kind of focus and lighting requires that nobody else who has anything to do the next day be in that room with you. So I would spend the nights alone with the babies and sometimes some of my other kids if they would join me. And, um, and I would just be up thinking my thoughts. It would always start with the wall. I hate this wall. <laughs> Surely there's a better pillow that could be designed for this. Maybe I'll invent this pillow. I need more help. I need a better nanny. I need care at night. Maybe I should get care at night and not during the day. How am I gonna get back to work? When am I gonna get back to work? Am I gonna get back to work? Can I have a job? And four kids, how am I gonna make dinner? When am I gonna make dinner? Should I look at recipes? So I would look at my phone. I mean, this, you know, the thoughts you have in the middle of the night. 
and I would look at my phone and feel this aloneness, and I so deeply wanted to connect with friends. And I would look at my social media apps, and I would think, oh good, I can connect, I can share what I'm going through and tell my honest truths to my friends. But I was bombarded with perfection. I made this mistake of following Insta yogis, all sorts of yogis, and I would see these beautiful forms and they would hashtag things like, get messy. <laughs> and they have this superhuman, incredible perfection. And then I would see humble brags, like, why do men hit on me more when I'm in sweatpants? It makes no sense. And it, it doesn't make sense. That's not what happens. <laughs> A friend of mine was writing on Facebook about um, how Sheryl Sandberg is everywhere these days. She's telling everyone to lean in. And <laughs> this girl couldn't figure out what she was going to wear when she appeared with her on TV on Monday. These are the struggles of everyday people. <laughs> Kate Middleton had just had her first baby. And I don't know if she had her hair done while she was having her baby or just after. But that was not my situation with the twins. And it made it really difficult for me to be in my aloneness in the face of this perfection. So while Kate was struggling with the reality of newborn twins, poor old me <laughs> was on a retreat in Mexico with a group of friends from Austin. And um, one of the women in this group was actually going through a really rough time in her life. And one day she and I were uh, taking a walk on this incredible beach in Tulum. And all she could talk about was this, how miserable she was with the situation that was plaguing her. So in her, I saw a friend in pain and I couldn't bear to watch it and not do anything. So I felt like I needed to soothe her, but at the same time I felt that you know, there were some difficult things that I needed to tell her and that she needed to hear. And uh, guess what? <laughs> it turned out that she couldn't handle it at all. And um, she burst into tears and went running down the beach. And at that moment, I went, oh my God, I've just ruined this beautiful friendship that I have. And, you know, <laughs> it was a very... Um, meaningful moment for me because I'd done it out of love and it had created, you know, an awful mess. Meanwhile, back in Austin, <laughs> my own oh-so-perfect life was in total upheaval. This is my picture, my Christmas card for that year, and I'll just say this. The ugly sweater theme is uh, not the most ironic thing about this photo. I was suddenly really hungry for ugly. I was hungry to discover what was behind the curtain of my life. I was hungry to figure out a path that would lead me to more honest connections. I was desperate to give advice to my friends and to other people like me who were resistant to change uh, because the pain I'd seen in my friend how she was stuck, and um, it just made me feel like I wanted to be on a mission to uh, be both personally and professionally uh, more honest. So Lucy came back from Mexico, and we went on this now epic walk. It was a vigorous walk. We were each wearing one of the twins in a carrier. And she explained to me what had happened with her friend. And she said, there's got to be a better way to tell people that you love things that they need to hear, to give them honest advice. And there I was, desperate for advice. And I thought, we can do this. We were desperate to build this thing. We craved the honest advice, both giving and receiving it. 
And we walked and we walked and Lucy would come over and make these salads, these ridiculous salads with Brussels sprouts and, and you shave them and you put them in a Cuisinart and it looks really ugly and messy and kind of sounds gross, but my God, they are so good and they have <laughs> grapefruit and avocado and she would make these weird salads and it was kind of an analog for what we were doing. We didn't know what we were making, but we were so excited about it. We were desperate for the advice we were compelled by the social psychology that people want to get better. You know this from a professional context. People want advice. We know people want it. We knew it was ugly. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. Neither of us had any experience in mobile. You can see my um, perhaps a tiny bit ugly drawings here in the first workflow that I ever did. We didn't know what we were going to build, but we knew that we needed to do it. We were so compelled by our situations. We knew that honest advice was ugly. We had had those deep experiences. And like this Kandinsky painting, we sort of went from foreground to background with the creative process in our foreground and our experiences in the background, sometimes blurring the lines, going back and forth. We're building this amazing thing. Go back to that place. What was that feeling that we had? What was it that we needed? What did you want to give? How did your friend react? How would I react if somebody had said that? And then I thought about all of the social psychology. That's what my background is in. That was what I knew. And we thought if we could figure out the exact ugly of honest advice and what people are afraid of, then we can solve it. We can fix everything that's broken. So I knew that ugly feeling, that helplessness and hopelessness of incompetence. I knew what that felt like. It's terrifying to, to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what to do. Help me. We like to think that we know our friends better than they know us. And when they tell us what to do, you think they're ugly. That's what Lucy's friend thought. You want to judge them. You know when you get a little bit of critique, even though you know it's going to make your work better, you want to judge where it's coming from. I know why you said that. It's because you're young. You've been trained in this specific school of design. That's not good feedback. You know it is. It's also easier to just keep on going, and we know that. Who here had a New Year's resolution on this last day of January? Anybody having a hard time keeping that resolution? It's hard. It's hard to change behaviors. So the science backs us up on this. There's a phenomenon that I love called illusory superiority. And this is David Dunning's work. And it's basically the above average effect. It's the fact that we all think that we're better than everyone else. So on a whole host of positive attributes, we all tend to think that we're in the top 1% to 20%, that we're all <laughs> above average. But we can't be. Statistically, that's impossible. So if I were to ask this group to rate themselves on intelligence, on creativity, on contributions to group work, on driving ability, we all think we're above average. And so that's why honest advice is hard because we're constantly creating these artificial realities where we're distorting the truth. And so when we hear the truth, it feels a little bit wrong. There was a recent study out of Harvard Business School in which they gave people the opportunity to ask advice of someone who had just completed the task that they were ostensibly doing. It was a math task. It's a frequent one done in the labs, and it's, and it's increasing in their difficulty. They're trying to put two numbers together with decimals to add up to 10. And when people were given the opportunity to ask advice of somebody who had just done this, they feared doing it because they thought they would be judged incompetent. But in fact, the people who did ask for advice were judged as more competent than those who didn't ask for advice. Another one of my favorite studies talks about how acts of omission loom larger than acts of commission when it comes to regret. So we regret the things that we have not done more than the things that we have done. And those things that we have not done that linger in our mind are those things that we don't do because we don't want to change our behaviors, because we stay complacent. So there's all of this evidence to do this, to embrace the ugly, and still, it's hard. When we figured out how we were going to embrace all of these things in our application, we thought, we can do this. You know, just X, Y, and Z, we'll just solve it. We'll create a formula for each of these things. 
And, and then we were bolstered by all that we saw coming out. We thought, people are ready for this. Everybody here is on board. We're living in this world of Photoshop fatigue. Every article we saw from June 2013 till current has been completely in line with this idea that people are ready for criticism. People are ready to put failures on their sleeve. In fact, in this whole world of documenting ourselves, we know it's making us feel more alone. That feeling that I was having of looking into my phone is quite common for people. So this really made us feel like the zeitgeist is right in line with ugly. We can do this. But our challenge, again, wasn't just ugly in the beginning. Our challenge was and is creating a sense of place for ugly that will persist and that is desirable. How do we make it exciting? How do we remind you of the benefits? How do we bring you through the ugly and tell you, at risk of being cliche, that it will be beautiful? So a sense of place for ugly has a few important components. One is a soothing aesthetic. Another is a window into the human condition, and a human condition of normal, where imperfections and flaws and the things that Nano talks about in his songs are real and true, and things everyone experiences. No manicured perfection, none of the things that I was seeing in Facebook and Twitter when I was there in the lonely nights. The other is an empirically grounded framework. All the structure that you need to give and get advice, to make it easy, to make it enjoyable. Anonymity. That's a big one. It's hard when you ask your friends for advice and they're right there in your face, right there to be judged. So a veil of anonymity helps you pick your close friends and then get that advice back without having to think about who said what. So remember, getting advice, getting the honest advice, is really desirable. We know that it works professionally. Rejection can sometimes take us to a beautiful place. There's this very provocative theory in human memory called desirable difficulties, which is so apt for this talk. And the idea there is that when we really want to learn something and remember it and hold it in long-term retention, you have to process it in quite difficult ways. It's kind of a take on the no pain, no gain theory, but it's quite literal. There are some strategies that you can take to learn things in a really meaningful way. And people tend not to like those ways. They're uncomfortable, they're a little bit ugly, and in fact, we don't like the professors who take us through those learning strategies because they're difficult. But things that appear optimal and effortless and are effortless, easy, pleasant, nice, those aren't the things that lead to meaningful change. So what happened to us? Well, what happened to me and what happened to my friend, um, happily she got the help she needed and her life is back on track. And our friendship sort of survived but was inevitably changed by that event. Uh, but what I think really happened was um, I changed. I no longer wanted connection built on, you know, friendly placations, masquerading as true support. And I wanted a way to build more authenticity in my important relationships. Uh, what that day on the beach made me realize was, I mean, it wasn't hard for anyone to see uh, all the things going on in my friend's life, but giving her the straight scoop on it was way too hard for her to handle in person. And that face-to-face -face confrontation meant that my advice had no chance of penetrating or being useful. And that is why the idea of an advice platform that had that anonymity built into it really took root in my mind. Here was a way to deliver difficult feedback the ugly truth in a way that wouldn't feel like an attack and that could lead people out of ugly and into beautiful outcomes. What happened to me? 
<laughs> what's happening to me? <laughs> it's still happening. It's a work in progress. But what happened is I went out to lunch with a friend who may or may not be in this audience. <clears throat> and um, the babies were about one year old, one year, one years old. They were each one year old. And, um, and I was telling my friend about some things that I had been talking about in therapy. And she stopped me under the influence of rosé. And she said, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you have this illusion of competence. And it keeps people out. That's why I didn't come and help you and visit you when you had the babies. You kept saying you were okay. And that's what people do. If you say you're okay, they act like you're okay and we stay out. I didn't want to get in your hair. And I thought about it and I, of course, rejected it because that's what we do when people <laughs> give us honest advice. And I said, I don't have an illusion of competence. I've constantly got stains on my clothes. I don't put up any facades. I'm real. <laughs> And um, I thought about it, and I thought about that moment of, of being in my bed with all the kids in my bed and sitting there and the, the aloneness that I felt. And I realized that I had aloned myself. I think when I was thinking about that idea of extreme motherhood, I kind of pictured myself being on a reality TV show for extreme mothering. And I got so into this idea that I could do it, that I had this mantra. I told myself, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And every time I said that to myself, I was telling myself and others, I don't need you, I don't need you, I don't need you. So I had put up these walls around my ugly. And I was denying the exact help I wanted, that desperation for honest advice. What should I do? Am I right to feel this way? What do you think about what I'm going through? Giving and getting honest advice can be the most profound experience. We've been doing this on a daily basis now for about a year and a half. And it's truly incredible now that we have this vehicle to get the exact advice that we want in the way that makes so much sense to describe what you're going through, how you're feeling, and the exact type of advice you need, now that I have that vehicle, that's what's happened to me. I've been able to use that and ask for advice and ask for help and get it. When you ask people who you love and or trust, about personal situations, complicated ones, and you get back the advice and you're not thinking about judging the person who gives you that advice, it is a poignant experience. The blind spots that our friends see that we don't in us are illuminating. And it takes us to a truly new place, the kind of place that your work goes to when you get that feedback from your friends. We really want to encourage you to step into that ugly and experiment with asking for honest advice in your personal life as you would in your professional life. It will better you. Ask for honest advice.